title of the book of Obadiah? I thought about going to Hosea. <laughs> Figured you could probably find that one. Hopefully. And then go forward to Joel, and then Amos, and then Obadiah. But I thought it sounded too smart, even though I didn't, smart aleck, even though I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I'm told the name Obadiah means servant of the Lord or serving the Lord. Um, He's called, the, the, the book of Obadiah is uh, many times called one of the minor prophets, uh, which our, our pastor is like anathema on. And you know, it, it's funny, I never heard anyone else, I don't recall ever having a, hearing anybody else not like that. Um, I, I wasn't as set or th determined that I didn't like it like he was, but years ago when I first heard it, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, I was like, that just sounds kind of a little funny, calling something in the Bible minor, but, but then, uh, then people said, well, it just means it's shorter. Yeah. I thought, oh, okay, you know, and I, it always seemed a little funny, but I, you know, then when, you know, many years later, I heard him say it again. I'm like, yeah, I remember not liking that. I never really liked that. And, uh, but I think he was on to something because every book you read about them Minor prophets are Hosea to Malachi. Well, if it's, if it's just because it's short, how come you don't count Daniel? Well, yeah. Daniel's right before Hosea. Why don't you start with Daniel? You could say Lamentations, but you could say, well, Lamentations written by Jeremiah and they couple them together. Okay, okay I'll, I'll buy La Lamentations you're not going to include. But how come you don't include Daniel? Daniel's 12 chapters long. Zechariah and Hosea are longer than that. Um, so I don't know, there's something funny about calling them that. Um, you know, I don't think someone's a heathen heretic when they do. I get it that some yeah. great men of God say it, but um, there's something not quite right about calling them minor prophets. But Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Third John's the shortest in the New Testament. Uh, Obadiah has 21 verses and a lot of words and a lot of letters. Um, <laughs> Everybody's always saying 432,103 yeah. letters. I'm like, I'm not counting to see if they, <laughs> did they make that up? You know, I don't know. I just, maybe, okay, maybe it's just an excuse to be lazy. But um, Obadiah uh, is the 31st book in your Bible. And so if you look at Isaiah 31, we'll look at a quick uh, thing about the comparison to the book of Isaiah, and then we'll pray and then get into, start getting into the book a little bit. Obadiah is aimed at Edom, as we'll see right, right off in verse 1. Edom is Esau, as we'll see. And in Isaiah 31, verses 4 and 5, it's God's judgment on, uh, and on uh, Israel's enemies... Um, the Egyptians in this case, but God's judgment on their enemies and defending uh, defending Jerusalem. God does it directly. Isaiah 31, 4, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as a lion, and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him. He will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for my, Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As the birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem, defending also he, defending also he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. And then you look at Ob Obadiah, and it's kind of the, a, a good portion of the book, but verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Re thy reward shall return uh, upon thine own head. Verse 18, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And then verse 21, where the Lord defends his kingdom, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord. So the 31st 
uh, book in the Bible, in, uh, the, in the Bible, Obadiah, has some things that, a theme that matches up with the 31st chapter of Isaiah, where God defends Jerusalem and Israel uh, from their enemies and takes vengeance on them for how they treated uh, the Jews. All right, so let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help me to put things across in a clear and understandable manner. Lord, help it not to be just head knowledge, Lord, but have uh, uh, affect our hearts and also to have a greater appreciation and understanding of how the Word of God fits together. Thank you how you've just put it all together. Just as, just as we're in, in a body fitly framed together, Lord, you put your Word together that way as well. And thank you for it. And uh, Lord, help me to uh, not dishonor it or be slipshod with it. Uh, but realize these are the living words of the living God. And uh, Lord, helps to have a better appreciation and love for your word for looking at this book. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we will try. Let's see. Lord willing, we'll get through verse 9 today. <laughs> we may only get to verse 3. But um, trying to do verse 9, not, I won't rush to get there. Um, but it's just uh, verses 1 through 9, our paragraph. Um, as you see, as in the start of verse 10, as Brother Brown would say, the pill crow, which I, 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 well, I think I heard that once like in uh, somewhere in English class 50 years ago somewhere, but I didn't really remember it until he said that. Um, but the Bible says, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. Now, when the Lord spreads a rumor, it, it, it's true and it comes to pass. And an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Kind of funny, we're ambassadors sent yeah. for, among the heathen. We're, uh, uh, only we're not pronounced, we, we're to warn them of judgment, but we're not uh, pronouncing judgment and getting them to fight each other, but to try to make peace uh, with the God who they've become their en his enemy. And, um, but it's funny how the Lord sends ambassadors among the heathen. Uh, but anyways, it says, uh, arise ye, let us rise up against her in battle. That's what the rumor, that's what the Lord's sending them to do. He's stirring them up. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised, speaking of Edom. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and thou, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence I will bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were, were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that, of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is, at hand, is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Made me think of, uh, I think it's, what is it, Psalm 137, 8. 
uh, that we just read sometime in the last week or so, um, where the Babylonians get done to them what they did to the Jews. Uh, verse 16, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. I always like the butts in the Bible. The butts, the butts and the butts nows, most, especially in Paul's writings, um, uh, because it's the biggest contrast from the Old Testament to, uh, or from lo law to grace, but probably also because it's, it's us. You know? <laughs> we get the benefit of the but now, so they do stand out uh, more. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the land of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim. And the fields of Samaria and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. All right, so the vision of Obadiah, if you, uh, the various visions that people, God gave various people, um, were not just something that they saw, but something that would come to pass. All right, so God g gave them uh, prophecies in that manner. Uh, but it goes on and says, Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. I, I mentioned that Edom is Esau. Uh, hold your, oh, your finger there or put a marker or whatever and go to Genesis 25. Genesis chapter number 25. Genesis 25 and verse number 30, and it's talking about Jacob and Esau here in this chapter and their birth. And I will start in verse 28. And Isaac loved Jacob, excuse me, Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. All right, red pottage, Edom means red. So uh, Esau and Edom are the same, same person. All right, so sometimes you'll see Esau, sometimes you'll see uh, Edom, just like you'll see Jacob and Israel. Okay, same, same person. All right, so in Ob Obadiah, we have heard a rumor from the Lord. If you, you might want to uh, go over to Jeremiah 49, you might want to leave a marker there, because we'll be going back over to Jeremiah 49. Uh, Jeremiah 49 is, has many parallels to the book of Obadiah. Obadiah 1, 1 said, We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. And Jeremiah 49 We'll read verse 7 to 22. Concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon them the time that I will visit him. If grape gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? We just, we just read pretty much the same thing in Obadiah. If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. You get the difference. You had robbers and thieves over in Obadiah. Robber, a, a thief is someone who's going to steal something while you're not looking. Okay? A lot of times we use the, the, the terms interchangeably today, but really a thief is someone doing it sneakily, either when you're not home or when you're sleeping or a pickpocket, something like that. Whereas a robber is going to come up and put a gun in your face or a knife in your face or beat you in the head or or threaten you. He's going, to, he's going to come to you and take it by violence or threat of violence. Okay. 
Uh, verse 10, but I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places. And he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Leave thy fatherless children. I will preserve them alive and let thy widows trust in me. For thus saith the Lord, behold, they, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And are uh, and art thou he that altogether go unpunished? Shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. Uh, we have to drink. If the Lord's having you drink punishment, that goes a long way with the, the, the cup of his fury when he pours out the wrath and the nations drink of it. For I have sworn by myself, said the Lord, that Basra, that's in modern day Iraq, it's in uh, Edom, shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all the cities thereof shall be perpetual waste. And here we are. I have heard a rumor from the Lord, like in Ob Obadiah 1.1, 1, 1, and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, gather ye together, come against her, and rise up to the battle. So over here it, it, it words it, gather ye together, come up against her, and rise up to the battle. And Ob Obadiah says, arise ye, let us rise up against her battle. So God's sending these messengers. I don't know if they're angels. I don't know who they are. But God is sending people, uh, uh, some type of messenger, to stir up these kings and nations to go to battle against Edom. What does Proverbs 21.1 say? When God wants nations to do something and kings to do something, you know when you see wars around the world and all that, you know, if I was, if, if, if I, I, love, I love my country, I'm patriotic, um, I'm thankful I, I live here, but if I had that same attitude and was lost, the way the world's going, I mean, I'd be a, I'd be a wreck, because, you know, if things are not going in a good direction, if you haven't noticed. But as a saved person, yeah, it'd be kind of nice if everything went smoothly to the rapture. I, I, I know, I get that. But when it's not... It's supposed to go this way worldwide. We're going to get there and, you know, getting close, you know, read the end of the book. We, we win. You know, we're on the winning side. We win because the Lord wins. And uh, so, you know, it's uh, nothing to be worried about. And when, you know, is Iran going to, you know, try to bomb us? Or is this, you know, Russia going to, you know, is Russia and Ukraine going to escalate in World War III and all that stuff? I, I don't want to see anybody melted or killed or anything. It's not that, but it's just like. God's, God's manipulating him in behind the scenes the way he wants. I know he allows the God of this world to do some things, but only within what he allows. Okay? Just like the book of Job. Satan does things to Job, but God allowed it to. In fact, God's, God started the fight. Hey, have you, has thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him. Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water he turneth it, whithersoever he will. That's one of the reasons uh, in Timothy it says pray for kings and governors and leaders all right, for two reasons. Uh, one, so we might live a, uh, a quiet and peaceful life. And number two, because God would have all men to be saved. Yeah. So I don't care what you think about Governor Lamont or President uh, Biden or whoever you, want to, whoever you want to think of in authority. Uh, you want to pray for them. Number one, so they leave us alone. We can live a quiet, peaceful life. And number two, so get saved. I, I don't care the le your least favorite, you know, sports guy or politician or whoever, your least favorite one you can. Do you really want them to go to hell for all eternity? I, I hope that's not the attitude. If it's not, you need to spend some time with the Lord because that shouldn't be the attitude. Okay? Plus, I know there's some people who are, gen who are lost, who are, you know, as humans go, good people. Uh, you know what I mean by good. All right? Just, you know, they, they, they basically have integrity. You know, they won't slit your throat without a reason. You know, I mean, they're just, they're, they want to do, they want to be decent people, okay? Um, and there's others that are not. I get that. But really, both of them need the same thing. They just need to get saved. If they get saved, all that, you know, can turn around, and the Lord can turn that around on them. But the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, so in Obadiah, uh, God spends, let's, let's send a little rumor, you know, send some little messenger from heaven, like he did when he said, uh, let's see, somebody, somebody go be a lying spirit. Oh, I'll do that. God says, all right, hey, why don't you go down there and stir those guys up, and because uh, it's time to judge Edom. And 
what happens? Send a little ambassador, Lord send a little rumor. And you know, it's funny these calls it a rumor. I, I'm not saying this is what happened, but what, why does he use a rumor? What if, what if God stirred their hearts and by letting them hear little rumors about the Edomites? I, I'm not saying that's what happened. Okay? I'm not, not trying to add into the word of God, but I heard a, it's funny it's a rumor. And ambassadors, maybe the ambassadors up there, you know, I think the Edomites are going to try to cheat us. Or maybe, you know, I don't know. But whatever, however he did it, he stirred them up against the Edomites. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly dis despised. Jeremiah 49, 15. I started to say what we'd read. I did say we would read through verse 22 in Jeremiah 49, but then I realized it's so parallel. We'll just read it as we go. For lo, I will make, Jeremiah 49, 15, for lo, I will make thee small among the heathen and despised among men. All right. Uh, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. It's amazing how many times pride just gets everybody, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it got Lucifer, and, uh, you know, now he's the devil and Satan and dragon. Uh, it gets us, saved or lost. Um, God hates it. God hates pride. Um, you know, we know all the verses, humble yourself and thyself on the side of the Lord, and he shall lift, uh, lift thee up, lift you up, lift thee up. Anybody know? I said, I'll, 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 I'll look. Where's that, James? Four. Am I combining them? Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Sorry about that. I hate when I do that, but I just draw on a blank. Five, six. And right, and then in James uh, four ten, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. So it is you, not thee. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so in De Deuteronomy two, Deuteronomy two. Um, as we saw in Genesis 25, Jacob and Esau are brothers. So Israel and the Edomites should be close. But the Edomites to this day are one of their worst enemies. In Deuteronomy 2, it's kind of interesting. The Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites, three of the five greatest enemies Israel has for the last 3,500 years, <coughs> 4,000 years. And they go into the land around them, east of Jordan and south of Israel and everything, and they, have, they all have to fight the same guy. The giants are up there. Uh, when, I, I don't know if there's an exception, but as far as I know, every time you see a, a people end in ites, they're human. And when you see them end in Eames, I-M-S, or I-M, they're giants, which are descendants of the, the, the angels and the humans, okay? Um, so the children of Lot, the Moabites and the Ammonites, they have to fight these. In Deuteronomy 2, verse 10, the Emons dwelt there. In time past, the people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emons. It's funny, remember Genesis chapter 6, um, where it says uh, uh, that there were giants in the earth in those days, and also, at, and also after that, when the sons of God came in and the daughters of men, um, uh, and the, the, their offspring were giants, mighty men of renown and all that. But it also says, and also after that. That's why in the New Testament you keep seeing Sodom and Gomorrah um, coupled with Noah and the times of Lot and the times of Noah. Um, you know, in Jude, you have the angels that left their first estate. In the same sentence, the, uh, the angels that rebelled in Noah's day and the ones that rebelled in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah's day, what did they do? In like manner, going after strange flesh and committing fornication. Uh, 
So who, where do you, who do you find in Genesis 14 at Sodom and Gomorrah? The Rephaims, the Zuzims, yeah. okay? So you get those, those giants keep showing up. And so it's not just the Jews that had to fight them to get the land with the Anakims, but the Moabites had to fight the Emims. And the um, verse 20, uh, the, the Ammonites in verse 19, verse 20, that also were accounted of the land of giants. Giants dwelt there in old, therein in old time. And the Am Ammonites called them Zamzumims, uh, which are the same people as the Zuzims in Genesis 14.5. I love those names. The Zamzumims and the Zuzims. And... <laughs> um, uh, verse 22, as, uh, verse 21, the people great and many are tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in in their stead unto this day, and the Avims which dwelt in Hazarim, and so on. So uh, the Edomites also had to fight these giants, so did the Ammonites, so did the Moabites, not just the Jews in that territory. And that's why you, if you look over there, it's, it's almost like an old, like the movies, all, the movies get their, you know, all their ideas from the Bible, you know, the land of the giants, that's actually in the Bible. You know, the valley of the giants, that's in the Bible. You know, the Rephaims and the, all those guys. Um, so what is going on here? Why is this? Now, in, in, in Obadiah, verse 15, it shows that it's beyond. All these prophecies um, from Hosea to Malachi, and really the other prophets too, but I'm, I'm just focused in on those in, in Obadiah, they're, they're a dual prophecy. There are a prophecy that's going on in that day. They're talking about events that happened then and judgment or some kind of prediction or restoration that's going to happen soon. But it also gives you clues like this, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. The day of the Lord is still future. I know there was a dead Lord in the Old Testament that was a type when he went to battle. But that term is used for something that's still future when the Lord comes back and destroys the armies of the Antichrist and so on. So whenever you see in that day and, and uh, in those type of things, it should trigger you to pay attention to, okay, did, not just then, but something else is going to go on. And when we get to those verses, there's things from verse 50, uh, 15 to 21 that never happened back in, in these days. They're still unfulfilled, and they'll be fulfilled in the future after we're out of here. Um, so the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. We know the heart is deceitful. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? So they're in the clefts of the rock, Jeremiah 49, verse 16. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart, O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Now, if you haven't figured it out by now, there's a lot of overlap and comparison between Obadiah and Jeremiah. Now, Bible scholars want to, want to relegate everything in the Bible to the past. Not all of them, but... Uh, uh, most of them, a majority. Why? Because they don't want it to have any effect on you or our future. They don't want to. They don't want to recognize or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is going to come, and set his feet on the ground and actually rule an earthly kingdom. That's why on the building of the um, United Nations building, there's a quote from uh, Isaiah 11:2 about you know turning your you know your weapon, you know, your spears and the pruning hooks and, and, and all that. You know, it's like you're basically turning your, I'm, man, I'm having so much trouble Swords quoting today. Basically, what is it? Swords in the plowshares. Swords in the plowshares, thank yous, and spears and the pruning hooks. Um, but they leave out the first half of the verse where 
That's only going to happen when the Lord's here running things. Why? They want all the promises that God gives about a utopia and a perfect society, but they want to run it. They don't want God running it. They don't want a kingdom of righteousness. They have the same problem that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees wanted the Messiah to come and throw, overthrow the Romans and put Jews back on top where they belong, but they wanted a Messiah like them. You know, who take bribes and they still get the chief seats and they, you know, get all, all the praise of men and all that. Um, that's the problem with men. He wants the promises of God. He just doesn't want God telling him what to do, basically. He wants to do what he wants to do. Uh, you know, it's really no different than Charlemagne or Hitler or anyone else. But Third Reich, what was a Reich? It's the, the third Roman utopia for a thousand-year Reich, a thousand-year thing where everything's good and there's peace and tranquility. To get there, all we have to do is kill everybody we disagree with. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's basically it. That's what Charlemagne was doing with the second, you know, Holy Roman Empire and all that stuff. We want, everybody wants a utopian society if they can only get rid of the people that don't think like they do. Okay? Probably sounds familiar in modern day politics. Um, so the cleft of the rock, all right? Uh, look at Job 39, and you'll notice uh, as we go through this book over the next however many lessons that on a number of occasions we're going to end up over in Job. Funny how that works out. Yep, yeah, it's coincidence. Or, or as I, I, I like to say, after about 800 coincidences, you stop thinking they're coincidences. But Job, if you'll recall, or if you don't know, uh, just keep it in the back of your mind. Don't take my word for it. But as you study it on your own or listen to other people teach it or both, hopefully, um, you know, just store it away. Okay, because you know, obviously we're not going to go through the book of Job today. But Job is a picture or a type of the nation of Israel in the last half of the tribulation, the, the 42 months, all right? Even to the, to the effect of 42 chapters. So Ob Obadiah, looking forward to the day of the Lord, is going to have some crossover to Job. So in the, at, being as an eagle in, up in the cleft of the rocks, make their nest high where nobody can harm them, they think. Job 39, verse 27. Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock in the strong place. There's that rock again. By the way, every time you have the, 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 you have the rock city of Petra, if you haven't seen that in the Bible, it was, it, it was on the, the um, last crusade, Indiana Joe's last crusade. You know, you got the picture. That was Petra. Okay, that's the, that's the main entrance to Petra. Um, it's funny, everybody, I, I do believe God's going to use uh, Petra as part of the hiding place for the Jews in the tribulation. But it's not a secret. You'll see, you still see books written today, God's secret hiding place for the Jews. It's a New York Times bestseller. If everybody knows yeah. that, that Selah, the city of, you know, Petra means rock or stone, uh, and Selah... You know, if you go into Hebrew to English, the Old Testament, it's Selah. If you go to Greek to English, it's Petra. And, you know, if you care. Um, you don't need to because we got a Bible full of it, full of rock, 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 rock. You know, and it makes those comparisons for you. But, you know, thou art Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone in John 142. Um, but if everybody in the world knows it and they make movies about it, I, I suspect... When the Antichrist rules the world, he knows. I think Satan already knows. So, yes, I think there's a lot of truth to it, but it's not a secret. So I'm just laughing at it with well, a secret hiding place for the Jews yeah. that everybody knows about. <laughs> and they take tours there. And <laughs> you can go there and pay your money and take a tour. Oh, well. Um, numbers 24. Numbers 24. I don't think we're going to get to the pill crow today. I deluded myself to being, okay, if we get to the pill crow and there's too much time, I'm going to stop anyway. <laughs> Numbers 
Numbers chapter 24, verses 20 to 22. The Bible says, And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. By the way, Amalek is a real person. We've seen him throughout. So just because God makes a parable out of him doesn't mean it's not a real thing. Just like the one allegory in the Bible or the one thing that's called an allegory uh, in Galatians between Sarah and Hagar, they were still real people. Just because God uses them as an allegory or uses Amalek as a parable doesn't mean it's not also literally historically true. And the reason I bring that up is when you go to Luke 16, 19 to 31 and talk about the rich man in hell and you're witness to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll always say, oh, that's a parable. Well, first of all, if you look at it, it's not a parable. But if it is, it's still true, it's still real, and he's still there. Okay? Uh, God makes parables out of real people. Uh, in Isaiah 22, he makes the whole chapter is a parable about the nation of Israel. Surely no one's going to argue that Israel exists. There's people that wish they didn't exist and are trying to get rid of them, but they do exist. Uh, that's one of the best ways to know you, can, you can know your Bible's true. You know, when people skeptic, 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 you know, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to answer a fool, but you could just say Jew. What? Everybody's been trying to tr kill the Jews for 4,000 years. God promised you're not going to, and they're still here. They're not only still here, they still have their national identity, their language, their religion, their culture, and you can't get rid of them. You shouldn't want to get rid of them, but I mean, you know, there are people, many people that, that want to. You can't do it. Uh, so, anyways, um, and when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be, uh, shall be that he perish forever. There's that latter end. just should be a little cue toward the tribulations. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk 2, or as I heard somebody say, call it Habakkuk. I don't know, I'm just glad it's not my name, you know. <laughs> imagine your mother, you imagine your mother calling these people for dinner, like Zerubbabel, Mahalalel. Like dinner's over by the time she finishes, like, they all have like 14 kids. By the time they see all those names, it's breakfast. I mean, you know. But Habakkuk 2, verse 9, Woe to him that coveteth in an evil covetousness to his house, that, sorry, um, that he may set his nest on high, yeah. that he may be delivered from the power of evil. And, but God is going to bring him down in verse 3 of Ob Obadiah. Um, so look at Amos 9. Amos chapter 9, verse 3, And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, now this is the Jews, but it's when God decides to, um, to, to send judgment, you can't hide. Uh, well, I'll start in verse 1. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door and the post, that the posts may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth the, of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite, bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. There's, there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. You can talk about the rock, call upon them, rocks and hills and mountains and rocks and all those and fall on us and hide us from the face of the, uh, hide us from something. This is terrible. It, that, that, that will keep, if nothing will keep you humble. Lately, <laughs> Brother Dave will tell you, I'm having so much trouble with Romans 10, 9, and 10. I've been knowing that verse 
since I was 9 and 10. I'm getting it all twisted up. Revelation 6, 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great David's wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You can't hide. You, you can't hide. You can't run. You can't hide. Uh, when God pronounces judgment, and that's what's going on with Edom in the book of Obadiah. And uh, we're, we're going to look at, a, a lot of people want to relegate it back to uh, 1 Chronicles 21, and we'll look at that. Uh, they don't want this to have anything to do with Babylon. We'll, we'll look at why. But there's thing, just the fact that it's such a parallel to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is all about, or most of it is about the, the coming destruction from the judgment from God sends through Babylon. And we'll, we'll, we won't spend a lot of time on why they do it, because who cares? Um, but we'll just a quick glance as to why they say it, and then, what, you know, why... If it, even if it did go back to Chronicles, this is primarily having to do with Edom turning on the Jews when Nebuchadnezzar shows up and doing it again when the Antichrist shows up. All right, Brother Paul, we pray.